well, she got involved, first of all, um, in a literary society uh, that Maud Gong was uh, involved in, and she got interested in Irish history and Irish culture. And the more interest she got in the whole uh, cultural Irish revival, the more she uh, got interested, in, uh, the more she became convinced that uh, it was important that um, Ireland be an independent country. Um, and also she was very aware of the inequalities that were there at the time. Um, uh, being a nurse and then later becoming a midwife, um, mm -hmm. she was very conscious of the fact that um, we had the highest rate of infant mortality. So, you know, she got gradually involved, didn't start off with the idea that this is something she was going to do, but um, was convinced really that it was the only way. And that's how she ended up. She ended up then joining Cumann Amon. Uh, she trained with Cumann Amon. She grew up very close to Padraig Pierce. Mm. And um, I think that's probably one of the reasons he would have, she would have been known to him. She would have known to a lot of the men, really. Um, they, they knew her through training and her doing her, her uh, nurse's training. So she was trusted because of that. Um, you know, she was well known. She was also not uh, that young a woman compared to some of the people. Like, she was 32. So you know she, you know she would have had her wits about her. She had a you know strong sense of you know of being uh, of you know being able to be in control and in charge. Well, my relative uh, Elizabeth O'Farrell, uh, better known as Nurse Elizabeth O'Farrell, uh, made her way over here with a couple of women. They thought the whole thing had been called off, and uh, they were out in the South Side branch, uh, based in um, uh, where Common uh, Nagelga is now, um, uh, over in uh, Six Harcourt Street. And they had to make their way over here, so um, only a few women actually made their way from that branch for them, uh, got into the GPO, and um, they started working in the GPO over the days. And it was on the 28th, Roderick Pierce asked uh, Cumann Amon, all the other members of Cumann Amon, to leave. Winifred Carney insisted, they went up and they said they weren't going to leave. Uh, Winifred Carney uh, wasn't going to leave Conley, um, she was his private secretary. And Elizabeth O'Farrell said there was no way she was going to leave either. There was wounded to tend to, including Connolly himself, uh, who was wounded. And uh, Julia Grennan, who was her lifelong friend and companion, said she wasn't going to leave her friend either. So the three women stayed. We left in three sections, there was bullets um, hailing all over us, um, this is what Elizabeth says in her account, and she said Padraig Pierce, she was in the last section, as they left in three sections, and Padraig Pierce was the very last to leave the building, to evacuate the building, he went around to check that there was nobody left behind and no, no wounded. So uh, they crossed then in three sections, uh, Elizabeth O'Farrell was in the last section, and they made their way then onto Henry Place, down Henry Place, okay. and then across onto Moore Lane. There must have been a lot of gunfire at the time. Or there was. There was bullets hailing over their head and it was very, very dangerous. Well, you'll find that Moore Lane also comes in in significance later on as um, uh, when she was making, when she was walking out with the actual surrender letter um, uh, that um, she also mentions Moore Lane and um, she, she mentions its significance to um, O'Reilly. Hmm. as well and um, she had earlier on she'd seen his hat and uh, I'd gone on the ground and she had thought that he'd made his way safely into a house and then um, when she came back then uh, later on with the um, final surrender thing uh, with Pierce she, they saw his, she saw his body um, it was very dangerous as well because there were again uh, bullets raining over their heads you look clearly, you'll actually see some um, some of the buildings and some of the scars and the bullets yeah. are still there. Okay, Donna, so do you want to say what happened here about the trip? Yeah, well, Elizabeth O'Farrell tripped. Um, well, they, they made their way, as you see, in quite a rush uh, after they got through the, the barricade and made their way down. And uh, she tripped here at the corner of uh, Moor Lane and Moor Street. And a Sean, a Gary came out and uh, helped her up and then she made her way into the into the house. And if he hadn't done that, you know, I think that would have been the finish of her, you know. So um, Elizabeth O'Farrell then made her way into the parlour of the house and many of the provisional government were already um, in the house and uh, she went over to James Connolly, he was in a, in a bad way at this stage, and she asked him how he was. 
and he said not good he said the she said uh, he said to her the British soldier that shot me uh, did a good day's work they tended to spend the evening then tending to the wounded and uh, whilst others uh, worked hard through the night burying their way through the houses and they moved then uh, through the houses and ended up at number uh, 16. Well this, I think this says it all, you know, I mean, this is hoardings for commercial um, advertising for bands. Now, I have nothing against live music, I think it's, it's great, but, you know, this is a very, very significant historical area. It's where they buried in, it's where my uh, uh, great-grand-aunt, um, you know, if that wasn't there, she nearly lost her life on, on, the, on the pavement when she, when she tripped up there, and she went there, and there was James Connolly, uh, the leader, you know, uh, 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 wounded in there and we have this in front of it I mean what does that say I and mean, that is such a lack of respect mm. a respect for those people and respect for our history and respect for ourselves as Irish citizens if we you know if we don't hold that to, in regard we don't hold ourselves in regard so the council of war was held in this building and they decided at that stage that they would surrender Provisional government members that held yeah. a uh, war council in number 16 Moore Street were Thomas Clark, yeah. Sean McDermott, yeah. Podrick Pierce, yeah. James Connolly, and Joseph Plunkett. Okay. And uh, Elizabeth um, was asked would she uh, carry the, the notice of surrender out to um, the British um, army and uh, they decided first of all to put a white flag outside the building so they hung a white flag outside here, it's actually outside this window, she actually stepped out at number 15 mm. and um, they put a white flag outside the window first of all and she herself had her white flag on a red cross and she stepped out, there would have been a door and she would stepped out here and she looked behind her and uh, we know it was number 15 because she knew herself that it was a very historic moment because she looked behind her and she said number 15 and uh, then she made her way um, down with the, the um, notice of surrender um, to the barricade mm -hmm. and um, spoke to uh, a British Army um, uh, the British Army there and they um, all he asked her was, oh, are there many women left? And mm. she said, there's just three women. And he said, well, you'd want to get them out of there. And um, he, then he was about to usher her back, push her back, put her back over the barricade. And then he realised that he should probably, he said, I should probably get this message to uh, my superiors, which he did do. And uh, she was brought then uh, to speak to General Lowe. And he said he would only take an unconditional surrender and that he would take it from Pierce himself. He said, what is he, is he, can he walk? Um, you know, does he need to be taken on a stretcher? And she said, no, Pierce isn't wounded. And um, he had got it wrong, it was Connolly that was wounded. So um, uh, she was also asked about Countess Markovich, um, uh, how is she holding up there? And she said, she's not there at all. So um, they had their information wrong. So uh, she went back to, and um, with a, a note from General Lowe to Podrick Pierce, they had another meeting and uh, a surrender letter was taken. This was about half two. Anna, do you want to say now what happened at this point? Well, this is the location uh, where the actual surrender took place. Um, it may have started the surrender on the other side of the, of, of the road. But over here is where the actual photograph was taken, the iconic photograph mm. where um, uh, Pierce, um, Elizabeth O'Farrell, um, General Lowe and his son uh, John Lowe um, and uh, Pierce handed over his um, sword which was a ceremonial um, me method of, of, of um, surrender. This is where the iconic photograph was taken uh, where people say that Elizabeth O'Farrell was airbrushed out of the photograph um, well, there was a bit of touching up on the photograph, which would have been a technique at the time. But the fact that um, uh, she wasn't seen in the photograph is because she stepped back herself. Uh, what was removed uh, was maybe the ends of her skirt and her shoes uh, later on in, some, in, in, in the publication. But if you see the actual original photograph is now in the ownership and it's in the National uh, Museum. 
and uh, with the, the Browning Sepia photograph you can very clearly see her skirt now mm. and her shoes and very clearly identify that she's there. Uh, she stepped out of it and um, she said that it was because she didn't want her photograph um, taken, uh, she didn't want to be identified in the surrender photograph, she didn't want to give them the satisfaction, but I think there were maybe many reasons, um, you know, uh, she was maybe conscious of her security, of her family's security, of her sister, you know, um, uh, as well being afterwards, so I think she was thinking of people and thinking that she didn't necessarily want her face identified. Later on she regretted it, um, and um, she admitted the fact she did regret it, I think it's because women's roles was then not seen as so significant and uh, women's role, um, they were very much seen as, as, as ha not ta have, having taken much of a role and, and, and when you came into the new free state of Ireland and the Irish government, not many women, um, ex bar Countess Markovic, were really um, remarked upon as having been involved. So mm. I think she thought, you know, had she uh, maybe stepped in front that that would have been a role model or something for to inspire other women and to let women know that um, that they did take an active role because coming on were not the handmaidens. Mm. You know, they were active. Um, some of them fought, some of them uh, nursed. They took various roles and, um, but all of them significant roles. Um, after that, um, type letters were given and, um, uh, General Lowe asked would Elizabeth O'Farrell uh, be willing to bring the uh, surrender letter to all the various garrisons and she agreed to that um, so um, after that Pierce was uh, led off and um, she was um, taken um, then um, down Parnell uh, Street and to make her way then down um, Cable Street and to go off then to the four courts um, so uh, that was the start of her journey uh, with the surrender letter. Mm. And that evening then, um, she actually um, spent in the National Bank up here. She slept uh, comfortably enough. Um, they hadn't had any sleep at all, so I suppose it was just exhaustion that put her asleep. And she'd had a, a bite to eat. Um, but she was conscious of the fact that um, her companions were out in the cold here on the on the, on the grass and the cold and the damp all night mm. and uh, but she had a comfortable enough uh, surroundings that night and uh, she got dressed the following morning and uh, she was taken off then uh, on her journey which was to go to all the various uh, garrisons. About six o'clock on the Sunday morning I rose and looking out the window I saw about 300 to 400 volunteers and Miss Grennan and Miss Carney who'd left the post office with me lying on a little plot of grass at Parnell Street in front of the Rotunda Hospital. They'd spent the night out in the cold and the damp, and all their arms and ammunition were piled up at the foot of the Parnell statue. I was only finished dressing when I was told I was wanted downstairs by Captain Wheeler to take me around to the other of the commandants. Sorry. After um, Elizabeth O'Farrell um, left Stephen's Green, and uh, she didn't come back with, you know, um, a definitive whether uh, they would surrender or not. And Captain Wheeler said, oh, she should have, you know, found out from them, you know, definitively whether they surrendered or not. They decided at this stage to uh, go to um, Boland's Mill where uh, De Valera was um, the commander. So um, they made their way there, but when they got to Butt Bridge, um, uh, Captain Wheeler said it wasn't any safer for him to go any further. Well, her most difficult journey, I suppose, was probably the one in um, making her way to Boland's Mills. Yeah. Because, yeah, that was probably the most difficult one um, because uh, she, they, the car couldn't take her any further. She was taken around in Captain Wheeler's car and it wasn't safe for him to go any further. There was um, shooting, a lot of shooting going on and um, the volunteers were still in the Boland's um, and on Westland Row and the military were asked to uh, locate the volunteers for him. But uh, they had a difficult job, so she had to make her own way basically down the road uh, herself under very f heavy fire. And um, at this stage, uh, just a couple of yards behind her, a man was shot, and um, she called for him to be taken in and taken to hospital. Well, when she made her way up Western Road, the military were lined up um, across the top and they were screaming at her, Go back, go back! Um, but she kept going, waving her little white flag, you know. And uh, when she got to the top, a soldier was sent with her to Clare Street to find an officer. 
um, and this being done the officer sent another soldier with her to pass uh, through the military lines at Hollis Street onto Marion Square. And I asked the soldier where were the volunteers firing from and he told me uh, from the gasometer. And then she went down Hollis Street and uh, went for a place into Harmony Row on the left hand side and proceeded down the railway bridge to Bunswick Place and called up to the volunteers but she got no reply. Um, many people were in the streets in a dangerous area and several women were standing in the doorway. And then she went onto Bromwell Street and over to the gas works and she tried to enter but she didn't succeed. Proceeded across Ringsend Bridge Road towards um, the Boland's Mill and there she saw lying on the ground two loaves and a hat covered with blood. So I mean somebody was obviously killed there. She called out to the bakery but saw like the previous places she got no reply. And across the Grand Canal Bridge the firing was terrific. At this point a man across the bridge about half a yard behind me was shot. And I called to some people in the house down the street and they ran up and carried him into uh, Sir Patrick Dunn's hospital. When she got to speak to De Valera, um, the volunteer on duty for deliver, he sent me around to the back and when I got to the back of the barracks I had to be moved and was lifted through the window into a small room. Here De Valera came to me. At first I think he considered the thing a hoax. He couldn't believe that uh, there she was, a woman um, with a surrender. But by the time some of the volunteer friends uh, came in, he realised that I was to be trusted. See, a lot of the men knew her and they said, oh, you know, they vouched mm. for her and said, you know, you can trust her. Uh, then he said, I will not take any orders except from my immediate superior, Commander um, Thomas McDonough. So after all my trouble in finding him, I had to go off again. Yeah, well, after 1916, um, uh, Elizabeth did her uh, midwifery and um, she trained in Hollow Street Hospital as a midwife. And um, uh, she worked there then with my uh, great grandmother, who had a nursing home. Um, uh, and the two of them worked in the nursing home. And um, there's a story with, in fact, a lot of people come up and tell me that there's this little song they sing around the North Inner City about children that were, um, uh, that she was a midwife, that she was there at their birth. And, mm. you know, so um, there's a little song they used to sing in the schoolyards and um, about that. So she, oh, she was a famous as a midwife. Uh, could you describe Elizabeth's uh, friendship with Julia Graham? Uh, they were lifelong friends and um, they lived together most of their lives I, um, since um, uh, and, and they shared a house and um, Julia Grennan actually outlived um, Elizabeth and Elizabeth uh, was um, buried and uh, then later moved into the, she was actually then moved into the actual um, the plot in Glasnevin and uh, Julia Grennan is buried with her. So they were really lifelong friends and um, I think the fact that the two of them um, went through such, such significant time together, you know, um, you know, which must have marked them in their life, you know, that the, 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 then, and even afterwards, you know, that, you know, the secrets that they must have had, the things that they maybe couldn't speak about to anybody else, that they could talk to each other about it. I mean, they didn't have anything like, you know, counselling back then, or, you know, they didn't even know what post-traumatic stress was, but I'm sure a lot of them dealt with that. You know, um, they saw some, you know, terrible things. They saw their friends being shot around them. They, mm. you know, experienced danger of, of being killed at any moment. Um, you know, um, people now are traumatised hearing one bullet shot, but they had constant, you know, bullets raining over their heads, building, falling around them, fire everywhere. So I think she had this constant companion that she could share that with, that they had something in common with and that they were both there to the very end together and, um, and I think it was great comfort for the both women to have that, uh, to have that friendship and um, you know I think it's lovely actually, the lovely friendship that they had and that they're buried together now so they're, they're there, there together in death you know as they were in life. I don't think she was ever really completely satisfied with the way things went, you know. Um, I think she thought that the Ireland of equals would have been better than it was, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, the words of, of the proclamation, you know, um, equal opportunities, you know, um, that every uh, child of the nation, child of the nation is every person, every citizen mm -hmm. of the nation, uh, uh, would have, you know, equal opportunities and I don't think she felt that that was actually seen through in her lifetime. Mm.
So I would like personally to see that the vision that the people had then, you know, we have come a long way because we don't have the sort of mentality rate they had then. We do have opportunities that we didn't mm. have back then and it is more equal, but not as equal as they envisioned. And I think a hundred years later, I think it's come a time now where we really want to see into the future what we want to see for our country, you know. Uh, we've been through, you know, booms and crashes, recessions and, you know, and now we need to look at the whole thing and you know see the vision that they have uh, had then and see that into the future and how we can um you know finally bring around the, the nation that they that these people fought for and wanted and um sacrificed their lives um uh, so that we would have this opportunity we now have the opportunity and i think it's important now to reflect on that and to take the time and um, for all the nation to reflect on that and to see how we can be um, and I think that's that's what you know that's what she wished for you know and um, that's what all the people that were involved what they wished for uh, was to have opportunities for all people in Ireland for every citizen in Ireland I'd like to see them remembered in um, in the way we live and in, in you know and uh, in the way we respect each other and that um, I think that's the best way to remember them.